Today on the Joseph Carlson Show, I'm going to explain how I expect to outperform the market doing something called value investing. And I'll be going through the differences of what value investing is and what it's not. Now, of course, we have some other news to get to as well today. We have one of my largest holdings, Vici, that had some big news. The latest announcement is that they're finally going international, starting off with Canada. Vici Properties has acquired four casinos in Canada. I'll be reviewing this deal, giving my opinion on it, and we'll be looking at the details together. We also have some Warner Media news. This company has really struggled over the past year, like every streaming company, but it's off to a good start in 2023. Now, we just had this extensive write-up that dives into the troubles that's going on in Warner Brothers Discovery. And this is mostly centered around the CEO, David Zaslav. He's the one that's made this deal happen. And we're gonna look at some of the disastrous troubles going on behind the scenes. And I think some things that are very important for investors in this company. We also have news that we're gonna be speaking more and more with AI chatbots than we realize. Microsoft isn't just integrating chat GPT into Bing, they're now putting it everywhere. They're gonna be putting it in Word and in emails. Sasha Nadella's plan is seemingly to use AI for everything. He all of a sudden moved Microsoft in number one of the AI company. So far that's been Google. They're always talked about as the AI company. But what we're seeing here is the biggest moves in AI are coming from none other than Microsoft. So we're gonna be looking at the details of how they're further integrating AI into this company. And then finally, we have some news that Bob Iger is telling Disney employees, get back to the office. That's the message he sent out to a lot of employees. He said it in a lot more flowery and nice language, but basically the message is he's telling them to get back to the office. I'll give my input on that and an update on Disney. So we have a lot to get into in this video. Before we jump in, just a quick shout out for today's sponsor of the video, which is Qualtrim. The website that I own that you can look up any of the companies listed on US stock exchanges and instantly see all the most important information all on a single page. And this is quite extensive data. Most companies just show you a couple years back, maybe max 10. Qualtrum shows you decades and decades of information right at your fingertips. If you haven't tried it out, there's a free trial. There's no risk to it. You can try out Qualtrum for free by using the Patreon link in the description below. Now let's go ahead and jump in. I first wanna start off by going over some differences in what this channel is, what my style of investing is, and what the style of investing is for the community here at the Joseph Carlson Show. We've had, over time, every single content creator gets to develop their own unique persona, their own reputation based off of their communication, based off their actions, based off their performance, and based off their portfolios and the way they're constructed. It's very easy to see the type of companies that different investors invest in. And at the Joseph Carlson Show, I've made an effort over time to highlight that I focus on high quality compounding companies, typically ones that do buybacks and dividends and ones that I characterize as compounders. Now these companies take various shapes and forms, but over time I've refined my portfolio and refined my portfolio over and over again to get to the point where every company I hold is hopefully a very strong compounder. In the consumer category, I'm looking for world-class companies with high barriers of entry, wide moats, and incredible brand value. And the collection of companies that I have in there, I think meet that categorization. One of them is struggling right now, which is Disney. I'll get to that one a little bit later. In the tech category, I invest in two different companies, Apple and Microsoft, which are big tech companies that have their act together. These companies are compounders. They have wide moats. They have incredibly strong core businesses. In the restaurant category, I've sifted through restaurant after restaurant, quick service restaurant after restaurant. I wish I could go through and highlight how many filings, how many quarterly reports, and how many earnings call I've listened to of different restaurants. It's so many. And I've landed on just a couple that I think are true compounders differentiated from the pack. Texas Roadhouse being one of them. I've given the bull case for this company, I've given the risk assessment for it, and I've given my reasoning of why this company will outperform. And so far it has widely outperformed since investing in this company over the past year. Starbucks is another one that I was buying in the 90s, buying in the 80s, and even made some buys in the 70s, and now this company's trading at above $100 per share. That's pretty good in today's market. In the financial category, I've decided to even alter my portfolio more with a bigger emphasis 
on wide moat companies with predictable earnings. I've started positions in S&P Global and MasterCard, and I've made aggressive buying of these positions a huge focus over the past couple of weeks. I sold off some different companies and put that money into these two different companies to get exposure to them while I think they're still good value. S&P Global and MasterCard, I think, are incredibly strong businesses, the top of the top tier of companies. And so I'm positioning my portfolio in strength with companies with high barriers of entry, low capital intensity, very minimal competition, huge network effects, and very high profitability. In the real estate category, I've also gone through a refinement process. I used to own five or six different REITs, lots of them that were in different categories and different business models. And I liked the diversification because I didn't feel too strongly on anyone in particular. But over time as my confidence and ability and being able to properly analyze a stock's future potential and risks, I become more confident in concentrating these investments into one company in particular, which is Vici. This is one that I found while visiting Vegas. I literally made my first buy while in Vegas. I felt so strongly about the company at the time. And this one has also been a wide outperformer over the past year and a half since investing in this company. In industrials, I focused on two companies that have both high barriers of entry, network effects, predictable earnings, and they're oligopolies, which means they have very limited competition. These are railroads, class one railroads. And that overall comprises the portfolio right now. All high quality, cash flow productive, dividend paying companies that have incredibly good moats. Now, I believe my portfolio has gotten stronger and better over time and better set up for the future, but I also stand by the performance of my portfolio since its inception. I think its performance does tell a story in and of itself. I am in the green by $35,000 since beginning this portfolio. Now, this isn't outlandishly good gains. I didn't 10X my portfolio or anything like that, but keep in mind, I deposited the majority of the money in this portfolio in 2021, the worst year to be depositing money. Basically, the overall market from then till now is in the red by a substantial amount. And we can compare the actual performance here. My portfolio over the past one year performance is down 10.68%, $41,000. That's a lot of money in the red, but when we look at the percentages here, the performance is minus 10.68%, and that beats the S&P 500, even factoring in dividends being reinvested. It's down 16.68% in price movement and around 14% with dividends included. We can, of course, stack that up against the QQQ, which is down 28% over the trailing year. Now, having said all of that, I don't want to give the impression or the suggestion that you should just copy my investments and buy into companies when I buy them and sell out of companies when I sell them. That is not the reason that I try to be transparent with my portfolio. I'd rather highlight the differences between the type of investing we do at the Joseph Carlson Show and the type of investing other people do, because there is a stark difference. With that in mind, I've gone through and highlighted a list of differences between companies that we invest in at the Joseph Carlson Show and companies that others invest in. But this is the companies that we invest in. Companies that have fast top and bottom line growth. There might be one exception or two exceptions of slower growing companies, but most of the companies in my portfolio are growing their top line growth quickly. Texas Roadhouse is growing its top line growth quickly, faster than the market. S&P Global growing its top line growth quickly. The companies that I invest in grow typically seven or 8% plus even during downturns, and they typically don't have years where they earn less revenue. They are true compounders. On top of that, one thing that I look for with every company that I'm investing in is strong bottom line growth. That is net income and earnings per share growth. Having both of those organically grow over time is something critical with my investments. The next thing that I'd highlight is something that very few investors actually pay attention to, is the companies that I invest in typically have persistently high returns on capital employed. Companies that have high returns on capital employed means they can reinvest back into their business and get extremely high returns. This is the number one characteristic of a good business. The companies that we invest in here typically have low debt. Leverage increases risk. Risk is something that I wanna minimize. So I wanna minimize the amount of leverage or debt with companies. We invest in companies that have high barriers to entry. That means that you cannot easily compete with these companies. If you invest in Union Pacific or Canadian Pacific, 
Have you ever heard someone say, hey, my family's opening up a new railway and it's gonna carry freight from one part of the country to another? That just doesn't happen. Every company that I'm looking at in a pool of companies are all ones that have strong barriers to entry. We invest in companies that have strong pricing power. That means that they can raise prices without losing customers to competition. And this is evidence of a moat. Companies like Starbucks have very strong pricing power. They can charge a lot of money because of brand value and network effect. The same thing with companies like Texas Roadhouse. Even companies like Pepsi have very strong pricing power with their products. They raise the prices continually without losing customers. We invest in companies that are monopolies or oligopolies. Now, most people know what monopolies are. They're companies that basically have no competition. They can price things however they want. An oligopoly is a little bit different of a term, but it basically means a monopoly with a few friends. We invest in companies that are boring. They stay out of the news and they're predictable. This is something very difficult to do, especially when so much investing is driven on YouTube and FinTwit and TikTok. Everybody seeks out popular, incredibly exciting companies that are always in the news. And on the Joseph Carlson show, we don't do that. We invest in companies like Vici that barely ever make the news. We invest in companies like Costco that are some of the most boring, predictable companies that are rarely in the news. On this channel, newsworthiness of a company is not an investment thesis. We invest in companies that have low execution risk from the management, meaning that the management's capital that they have with their free cash flow has very minimal opportunity for the management to really screw things up. They can typically pay dividends, they can do buybacks, or they can reinvest back into the company at attractive rates of return with a very predictable business. And then finally, we invest in companies that simply put have low disruption risk. They are companies that are unlikely to be disrupted by the economy, by market cycles, by competitors, or by new disruptive tech startup companies. The companies that we invest in are highly insulated from disruption. So overall, this is the list. This is the type of investing that we're looking at here. Now, I wanna highlight how this varies and differs from other investors. Here are some of the attributes of companies that others invest in. First of all, they look for companies that have cool logos. For most investors, that's a pretty important part of the investment thesis. Does the company look cool? Does it have a cool logo? Another important thing is that the company is very popular. Everyone knows that we, we just love to fit in. Humans are social beings. From childhood, we're taught that we should be, we should be accepting, we should be inclusive. And being exclusive is not a good thing. It's not a good attribute. People like to fit in. And naturally, as humans, which are social creatures, we are attracted to very popular stocks, very popular companies. The more known it is, the more popular it is, the easier it is to be invested in those companies. Other investors invest in exciting companies. They're new, they're flashy, they're usually focused around technology, some disruptive, innovative, exciting new company. Other investors like to invest in companies that are constantly in the news. They typically get in the news every single day. In fact, the more they're talked about, the better, the more it attracts different investors. And on top of that, it's great for the news because these companies, they get clicks. When you put the name of these companies in the title of videos or the title of articles or in tweets, they're going to get a lot more clicks than their boring counterpart. Other investors invest in companies that are in a dip. If the stock price went down, it doesn't matter if the fundamentals are deteriorating, it's a dip and we've been taught to buy the dip. Other investors invest in companies with predictions of revolutionary change. The investment thesis for the companies are usually huge, globally dominant, revolutionary changes, things that have to unfold over a certain period of time that will change the world as we know it. Other investors invest in companies that dilute shareholders. They typically issue shares over and over again to fund their business because they have weak profitability. When a company has weak profitability, the way that it raises cash is either by debt or issuing more shares. Other investors invest in companies that have low returns on capital employed. They invest in companies that usually have intense competition. These aren't monopolies, they're not oligopolies, they're companies that are right along with a lot of other companies in competition. Other investors invest in companies that are highly unpredictable. Unpredictable is almost synonymous with exciting. Think about this for a minute. If you went to see a movie and it was predictable, is that an attractive attribute of a movie? It was entirely predictable from beginning to end? No, that is an unattractive attribute if you're looking for excitement. You go to the movies to have excitement and entertainment. Well, many investors, in fact, I'd say most other investors, 
They want excitement and entertainment in their investing. So they look for companies that are not predictable from beginning to end. They look for companies that are entirely unpredictable because that's more exciting, more newsworthy, more changes, more drama. In the view of most investors, the more unpredictable the company, the better. Other investors invest in companies that have immense execution risk. Everything has to go right for the company to work out. All of these big claims of revolutionary changes and predictions and the company executing perfectly have to work and other investors invest in companies that have immense disruption risk. Many times the disruptor is a company that ends up being disrupted. And if these companies have competition, execution risk, they also have disruption risk. And now that we've observed and highlighted a simple differentiation between my type of investments and the community here and most other investors, I think it's good to also highlight the differences in mentality between us and other investors, because I believe this is equally important. In fact, I think in many cases, mentality is even more important than the specific investments you're making. Here's our mentality at the Joseph Carlson Show. We don't get excited when the market goes up. That's a simple one. Usually people are very excited when the market goes up. You can even feel the enthusiasm with them talking. We don't get sad when the market goes down. That's equally as important. When prices go down, future expected returns go up. And if you purchase good companies, which you have conviction in, based off of your extensive research and knowledge about the company, we actually get more excited when companies go down in price when the value proposition has improved. We're patient and we're okay with being bored. I've highlighted since the beginning of this channel that I like boring investments. They are good investments. Boring is the opposite of exciting. Exciting means unpredictable. Exciting means bad investing. When I look at the best investments that I've ever seen, many of them are the most boring investments, but that is a difficult thing to do. Most people pretend like they're okay with being bored, but they really can't handle being bored. We're also okay with not fitting in with the pack. We don't have to invest in the same stocks that everyone else is. So when we look at doing analysis on stocks, we do not factor in if other people are investing in it. We don't give in to social pressures or peer pressures of when to buy a stock or not to buy it. We also do not get emotionally attached to a stock. All a stock is, is a way of making money. And like Peter Lynch said, the stock doesn't know you own it. So if you have an emotional attachment to the stock, it does not share that relationship with you. It is a one-way relationship that does not benefit you. So at the Joseph Carlson Show, every stock is able to be sold. Every stock is able to be criticized. We stay cold, calculated, and systematic. With our funding process, with their capital allocation, with the companies we're buying and the valuations, everything's looked at through the lens of reducing risk and raising future expected returns. And doing that in the most systematic and calculated way as possible. We don't gamble here. We take calculated, educated guesses, and we do so with a high future expected return. Even a great company isn't worth an infinite price, and so we try to have a margin of safety not only with the fundamentals of the company, but also with the implied performance already in the stock price. No investor gets every single investment right. Eventually, we're going to get ones wrong. And when we do that, we try to be upfront about it, have introspection and analysis about what went wrong, and try to avoid the same mistake in the future by making real material changes to future analysis. And then finally, our mentality here is to be transparent. On the Joseph Carlson Show, we are transparent. We have real transparency with full performance updates every single video. I show you the dashboard of my portfolio with the total performance since the beginning of the portfolio. I don't show you snapshots of the holding page of one portfolio out of five where it doesn't include all the companies that I sold at a loss. That's not what we're doing here. What we're looking at here every single episode is an audit of my performance and what we're doing here, the results of this work. And this is something that is still, even to this day, incredibly unique online. Most channels, in fact, almost all of them, they just talk about finances. They talk about stocks. They never actually show their performance with transparency from the beginning in totality every single week. So this is our mentality here. This is the mentality of what it takes to beat the market on a consistent basis. And this is something that most investors say they can do, but it's very difficult. It's much easier said than done. If we contrast this mentality against what most other investors are doing, this is what it looks like. Other investors' mentality, first of all, most others enjoy gambling. They like rolling the dice, taking risks, seeing if things pay off, seeing if the market goes up. That's why most people play the lottery. They justify it and rationalize it in different ways. They explain it away saying, I just like the dream of maybe becoming rich, 
But deep down, people enjoy gambling. You know how many lottery tickets I've ever purchased? Exactly zero. Because I know the risk-adjusted returns of purchasing a lottery ticket. It is not in your favor. Most other people not only enjoy gambling, but they're also excited when the market goes up. It means that their gambling's paid off, they've made money, they feel better, they feel wealthier when stock prices go up. Others take great comfort in investing in popular stocks. The more it's talked about in the news media, the more their fellow investors are investing in that stock and talking about it and how great the future is and how great the stock is over and over again in videos, the more they feel good about it. Others are sad and nervous when the market goes down. Others become emotionally attached to the stocks they own. They view them not as just stocks, but they're a part of their personality. Others don't take criticism well with their stock because they're right, they've done the research, and they get quite defensive if anyone criticizes a holding of theirs. They lash out against criticism against any holding they have. Others are unwilling to admit mistakes or change strategy. Even when the facts change, even when the data changes, even when the company's performance changes, even when different risks come to fruition and change the story of a company, most others have strong anchoring biases. When they buy into a stock, it's very difficult to admit it was a mistake and to change strategy. Almost all others online are entirely opaque with their performance. They don't show it in totality from the beginning of their portfolio. They rarely show it at all. And if they do show it, it's usually snippets of their current holdings where they've eliminated and sanitized any previous performance that would make them look bad. They are entirely opaque with performance because performance is accountability. And it's much easier to talk about companies than be accountable with actual performance. And then finally, most other investors, in fact, this is likely one of the biggest mistakes investors make in general, is that they're unable to separate a company's fundamentals from what's already implied in the stock price. A company may have a great future ahead of it, but if the stock price already has that baked into the cake, if it's already expected, then there is no superior returns by owning that stock. So again, when I stack up the differences of our mentality here at the Joseph Carlson Show against most others' mentality, this is what it looks like side by side. We not only have a striking difference in the type of stocks we buy and the type of characteristics we're looking at in a stock, but we also have dramatic differences in the type of mentality, the type of way that we look at stocks and hold them and behave as investors. And both of those play a role in the ongoing performance. Now, of course, this isn't all of the differences, but I think it highlights a few of the key differences between this channel and many other channels you're gonna see. In summary, long story short, Welcome to the Joseph Carlson Show. We do things differently here. I'll be showing this journey transparently every single week and my total returns. And I do have high expectations for this portfolio. I do plan on beating the market and generating alpha over the S&P 500 over the long term. And I think I can do this on a semi-consistent basis. So I'll be showing you how it turns out either way, if we succeed or if we fail but that's the goal. Now, having said that, let's go ahead and move on to some news about one of the companies in my portfolio. Vici Properties is one of my bigger holdings. I have over $40,000 in the company. I'm currently up $10,000 on it. And this company makes up 12% uh, of my portfolio, a little over 10%. So it is a major holding. And I'm concentrated in this company because I think the risk reward is really good. I think it's going to continue compounding. It does have some risk because it's real estate and it is a levered company. It works with debt. So that has to be known about this company. It does have risk in terms of debt. But having said that, I assess the risk of bankruptcy or future liquidity problems as very low. So I'm happy to have this as a significant holding. Now, this company has been on a growth streak. Vici Properties is a growth monster. It looks like it's just a REIT, but real estate companies can grow if they have the right team. And I think Vici Properties in particular has a team. They're executing everywhere. They're doing so systematically. They're doing so with an emphasis on risk-adjusted returns. For example, in this press release, they say just today that Vici, the Experiential Real Estate Investment Trust, announced today that it acquired real estate assets, so just the real estate assets, not the casinos, just the property. They say the casino Yellowhead in Edmonton, Alberta, the casino in Calgary, and a casino in Lethbridge. So they purchased a bunch of different ones in different places in Canada for an aggregate purchase price of approximately $200 million US. Vici financed the transaction with a combination of cash on hand and from drawing down funds under its existing revolving credit facility in Canadian dollars. So they actually did no dilution to finance this deal. 
They're not issuing more shares, which is traditionally what REITs do. But Vici produces so much cash flow, even beyond their dividend, that they have about a half a billion dollars per year to work with. So they're using some of that cash flow to pay for this, and they're taking on a little bit more debt to finance it. I think a very good combination. I think it's great that they're not having to dilute shareholders to make this deal happen. And that's probably why the stock isn't down today. It's up a half a percent after this deal. Almost always, if Vici announces a new deal and they say they're diluting shareholders, the stock goes down right away. But investors probably read the news, saw that there wasn't dilution being used, and they decided that this one gets a pass. They're buying this property, and then they're instantly leasing back the property. That's part of the deal. So basically, they're buying a rental property with renters in it that have already agreed to a 25-year rental agreement. The actual price that they paid for this, I think, was very reasonable. The cap rate, which in real estate is basically like the yield, that's the total yield of the property you're getting, is 8%, which is very high. That's a good yield for this property. I think most real estate right now is yielding 5%, 6%. Uh, sometimes seven, but getting 8% right now is very good. So this is immediately expected to be accretive upon the acquisition, meaning that overall this is a benefit to the shareholders of Vici. In my opinion, this doesn't really change anything in terms of my investment outlook for Vici. I expect them to do many more deals like this in the future. Now moving on, we have this in-depth write-up of a lot of the struggles that are going on with Warner Brothers Discovery and specifically with the leader, David Zaslav. Now, this is a company that I've often said I'm not investing in because I, I view it as a bit of a value trap, specifically the amount of debt this company was left with. It's just left with a lot of debt. When they separated from AT&T, AT&T really got the better end of that deal by handing off over $40 billion of debt to the Warner Media Discovery Company. So it's more of a leveraged buyout where you use an immense amount of debt to buy a company. And you can see that reflected in the financials. Now it gives some backstory in the how the deal happened. It basically happened over the course of a year. David Zaslav made this deal happen. And right from the get-go, with just the announcement of this deal, a lot of people were left with a bad taste in their mouth. Not so long ago, Discovery was dismissed by industry insiders as quote, trash TV. Now it's swallowing up large swaths of Hollywood. So that's kind of the view here. You have Discovery, which are these, these reality TV shows, trash TV, and Zaslav used Discovery to buy HBO. A lot of people underestimated the power and reach of Discovery. And they say most of us who have been close to Discovery knew it had potential, but a lot of people in the marketplace were a bit surprised. Now, like I mentioned, this report goes over the staggering amount of debt that happened with this deal. It's more of a leveraged buyout, a takeover, than some nice little merger or transaction. They say Discovery acquired the Warner properties from AT&T for 40.4 billion in cash and assumed nearly the same amount in debt. And then of course, once they did the merger, the big problem is the outstanding debt of the company. Long-term debt can cause bankruptcy if it's not dealt with right away. So once in control, Zaslav took aim at the crushing debt he inherited, and many of the cuts hit hard. He cut 25% of the staff at Discovery. He announced the closure of CNN Plus, streaming channel that they just launched uh, a couple of weeks, it seemed like. They spent $300 million on it and they had 300 employees. Completely scrapped that. The beloved Cartoon Network was gutted and a plethora of existing content was removed from HBO Max, including almost 200 episodes of Sesame Street. And the cutting didn't end there. This is what has been going on for the past six months. The company is being gutted from the inside out. Zaslav decided to cancel the feature film Batgirl, a nearly completed trouble-free production that had finished a seven-month shoot. The cast of the movie received no warning before the story landed in the New York Post. That's a way to build relationships with the cast. Let them work on a movie for seven months straight and then have them find out in a different news source that their movie's been scrapped. And obviously there's backlash from talent. Brendan Fraser, who was cast as the villain Firefly, called the decision, quote, disappointing. He said that what we're learning from this is to work with trusted filmmakers, implying that the new regime here is untrustworthy. Zaslav's welcome with the various Warner Brothers properties is now tempered with outrage and suspicion. One insider of the company, who could not be identified, expressed genuine sympathy, saying, quote, I feel like he's ruined half of the friendships in the last six months. And I hear from other people about the toll that's taking on him. I can't help but think that the last great day of his career was the day the deal closed. Every day since has been 
a shiz show. And this report goes on and on and on. What it highlights is the consequences of debt. That is what he's dealing with. Even though he's making all of these cuts and he's gutting the company, everybody that really criticizes him and is shocked with some of the moves he's making, almost all of them still agree there's probably a reason behind it. Warner Brothers Discovery has a lot of debt and that debt comes with a price. So this has been the focus of Warner Brothers Discovery since the deal has been made. And again, I highlight this as one of the key things I look for in companies, low amounts of debt. Any company that I've invested in with high amounts of debt typically has these type of struggles. So when I look at companies like Warner Brothers Discovery, even though they have incredibly good assets, I'm still remaining in my initial position that I'm concerned about this amount of debt. Now, moving on from Warner Brothers Discovery to a company that I am invested in, which is Microsoft. This company does not have a debt problem. It's not over leveraged, and this company is on the move. They're going head to head with Google. And Sasha Nadella, if he can take market share from Google and beat them at their own game in AI, I think if he's able to do that, he may be known as one of the greatest CEOs ever. We've already heard the breaking news that Microsoft's investment into OpenAI is now expected to be getting its return. Microsoft is wanting to integrate that technology into Bing Search, to have a more competitive search with Google and to force their hand. Now they're doing a lot more and it seems like their ambitions with AI are much broader and much more present and real. They say for more than a year, Microsoft engineers and researchers have worked to create personalized AI tools for composing email and documents by applying OpenAI's machine learning model to customers' private data, said one person with direct knowledge of the plan. It hasn't been previously reported until now. Engineers are developing methods to train these models on customer data without it leaking to other customers or falling into the hands of bad actors. The AI-powered writing and editing tools also run the risk of turning off customers if those features introduce mistakes. Now, the interesting thing about this is we know that Sasha Nadella had the foresight to fund these projects years ago, investing a billion dollars into them. So this wasn't a small bet. This is something that was very intentional by him. For Microsoft CEO Sachin Nadella, deep ties with OpenAI are part of his goal of drawing more revenue from AI tools. In the coming years, including in existing products such as Word, Outlook, Teams, and the Windows operating system, according to people with direct knowledge of his plans. Sasha Nadella and the OpenAI team have been basically working together. He's writing them the paychecks to develop these tools to be able to integrate into their massive suite of software. And if they can effectively do that, that will give them a greater moat against competitors. So overall, I like this news for a couple different reasons, and I think it will be exciting to see these big changes that Microsoft's making. Now moving on, we finally have the news that Disney is now telling people, specifically Bob Iger, the new CEO of Disney, the return CEO, is telling the employees to get back to the office. That's the message. Now, he says it in a very flowery, nice way. Bob Iger is a diplomat. He is a politician. He's very good at communication. But overall, I think the message is good. Getting back to the office, I think, is a good thing. And I think the bigger point with this news and my bigger takeaway, it seems like basically everything is going back right to where it was the way before. There's almost no lasting or enduring changes from the pandemic. It's just slowly moving back and merging back to the way things were before. And this is, again, one more company in the long list that's now forcing their employees to come back to the office. So that's the last bit of news for now. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Check out the Patreon if you're interested in trying out Qualtrum, and I'll see you in the next one.